Well, hello and a warm welcome to episode three of the Dr. Sill podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having a discussion with Dr. Russell Barnes. Russell, like me, is a psychiatry registrar, but he is in stage three, so approaching the end of his training. Russell is interested in neurostimulation as a form of treatment in psychiatry, and I've always enjoyed talking to him about ECT when we're catching up at work, so I thought it would be great to bring him on for an episode and to talk about ECT in this podcast. This was a wide-ranging discussion we had. We talked about the history of ECT, stigma of ECT, myths and misconceptions, the indications, the side effects, importantly, what it is what it is like from a patient's perspective, and we reflected on our experience treating people with ECT. But before we get into the discussion, an important disclaimer and reminder that both Russell and I are doing this in a personal capacity, that the opinions we are sharing are our personal views and do not represent a workplace or a medical college. Any advice that we may share is general in nature and does not constitute medical advice. There is no patient-doctor relationship formed by engaging in this content. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the discussion. Thank you for making the time to do a uh, podcast with me today, Russell. I think um, it was a really good idea to talk about ECT. It's, uh, to me, a really important treatment that's probably under-recognized and Absolutely. maybe underused um, as secondary to the fact that it's not well understood. It's been yeah. socially stigmatized. There's a lot of stigma. And um, it's a really important treatment for people who have had a treatment-resistant depression, who've tried lots of other things. Mm. Um, who have severe symptoms, but also for lots of other illnesses. So thank you for helping uh, clear the topic up a little bit for me. Sure. I've got lots of questions for you, but I think a good place to start is from your perspective, why is it an important thing for us to talk about today? Well, I remember when I was um, in first year medical school and I heard that ECT was still a thing. I think at the time I kind of just assumed that this is one of those things like lobotomies where, you know, like... In hindsight, it was kind of barbaric and wrong and that, that, that it had stopped, right? Having seen, you know, um, lots of popular kind of culture and movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, for example, um, and I, uh, there's just lots of people, I guess, that kind of thought that way. So I was kind of surprised when I learned that it was still happening and a bit kind of like shocked, I guess. Um, and But my medical school, to their credit, Uh, went out of their way to try and expose people to modern ECT to, I guess, dispel exactly those sorts of myths. So that's probably a good place to start, Russell. Maybe you can start by providing us a bit of an understanding of the history of ECT. Yeah, sure. Uh, So it came out of some observations that were made where uh, people were noted to get better, uh, sort of recover from psychosis um, following seizures, either because they had epilepsy, um, sometimes it was because they had a, you know, um, a strong fever. um, And uh, for whatever reason, there was an association there between the the seizure and and recovery. Um, And so... uh, Back in the 1930s in Italy, a, uh, an Italian a physician by the name of Soletti um, first experimented on uh, producing a seizure using an electric current, um, initially in dogs, and then um, with the aim, I guess, to find a safer and more effective way. Um, previous to that, they'd been using insulin um, and, and other medications or substances that were, in fact, quite toxic. Um, And while they produced a seizure, um, which might have been beneficial, the actual, um, the rest of the experience was was, was dangerous and and harmful for the patient at the time. So there was a need to find a better way to do it. That's right. Yeah, I think I remember learning about how they used camphor as one of the first um, kind of chemically induced seizures. Yep. Um, And the insulin comas and how that resulted in lots of deaths. Yeah. And... uh, yeah, so then, so then they moved to a different stimulus, not chemical, but uh, electric uh, in nature. And I think initially they didn't use uh, anesthesia 
very well uh, or in some places at all. At all, yeah. And I think that's, that's right. where a lot of the negative uh, stigma started from. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I don't know if you'd call that stigma because that was a horrible thing. Yeah. More like um, a grim reality of the, of the time, I guess. But, uh, yeah, so originally it was just given to fully awake conscious patients um, and because the uh, it produces a... Um, a tonic clonic so a generalized seizure and it affects the whole brain it tends to cause quite serious um, convulsions and they can be quite dangerous as well people would break bones um, tear muscles um, and be very sore you know following the treatment so this is 50 years ago mm. and i think we started off on a note of uh, how bad it used to be Let, yep. let's maybe fast forward to what it's like today yep. and then we can look at some yeah. of the uh uh you know issues with it but because no no treatment is perfect but it's mm. much better than it used to be yep. uh so um maybe we take a little journey well yeah what, what is ect like these days yeah, so these days there's been a number of developments, but probably the most important one is that it's given with a general anaesthetic. You know, these days it's a modern surgical procedure that happens inside of an operating theater with an anaesthetist there um, who gives the anaesthetic. So when patients receive it, they're completely unconscious, um, they're being closely monitored. Um, also, the other, I think, main. Um, uh, intervention that would define modern ECT is that muscle relaxants are given at the same time. Um, and so no longer do you have people having serious injuries or broken bones. Um, people tend to, um, I mean, these days it's, uh, people will have ECT, you know, three times a week, um, and often can be sort of, um, on their feet and going about their business, uh, the same day as having a treatment. That's right. It's, it's much better tolerated these days. Yeah, yeah, it's a day procedure. You can be home by midday. That's right. Um, and people are quite shocked to, to hear that sometimes, yeah. how, um, how quickly uh, they can recover. Um, that's right, yeah. So in, in a typical seizure, there's the um, brain stimulus trigger, you know, the seizure is triggering the whole body, mm. all the muscles to contract in right. initially in that tonic that phase tonic, and then in the... Yeah. Um, clonic phase mm -hmm. but with the muscle relaxant hits that neuromuscular junction and impairs mm -hmm. those impulses from creating um that you know, very strong contractures that yeah. can actually break bones exactly yeah and so often the, the language around that is well modified so we've Correct. modified the the motor response and reduced it and so uh you know often when we've done ect and you've done a lot of it as well as a registrar you don't uh, you know you're not you're, you're under the supervision of a consultant, but yep. you do a lot of the observations and, and, and the monitoring and the electrode placement mm -hmm. and lots of lots of things. But you, you, you see lots of seizures. And so mm. you, there are still small mm. movements. Um, there are. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's nothing uh, like a, a classical seizure when there's no muscle relaxant. That's right, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you've probably seen through, you know, working in ED and yep. through those junior years, horrible seizures with mm. people completely unable to be controlled um, yeah, i had to get scary. a cannula in someone who was seizing once and that was hard but i got the rhythm of the of the movement and got the cannula in and then we were we had to give propofol to send them to mm. icu for that that was bad but uh yeah so it's much less um yeah kind of dramatic in movements yeah exactly yeah so run me through what a patient would experience if they if they're going in for their first ect yeah, I think probably the first time for a patient would be a course of ECT, a, a, an acute course, we would say, um, that occurred whilst that patient was in hospital for some reason, usually because they were very unwell. Um, and so I suppose prior to the actual day, um, the treating team involving the psychiatrist or perhaps the registrar would be talking with the patient to go through the details and trying to um, uh, get them as up to scratch with the what to expect and those kinds of things as possible, um, go through the consent process and everything like that. Um, then on the morning, um, we would have people um, fasting so that because they're having an, an anaesthetic um, like any other procedure, they'd be fasted. Um, and so normally there's an ECT 
coordinator, an ECT nurse, and so they'd um, bring the patient from the ward over to the, um, the operating theatre where, where the ECT is delivered. Uh, it happens inside the operating theatre, so usually the patient's wheeled in, um, say hello to the people there in the room, the, the psychiatrist, the anaesthetist, and everyone will say hello, um, and usually um, then get them prepped and ready to go for the procedure. I yeah. Think. So I think the, the patient usually goes into that waiting area. Mm. They get a set of observations done. Mm. They might have to wait a little while, right. but there's, there's the nurses around and they can answer questions if needed. Uh, and then when it's, I guess another thing is you're fasted, but it's usually done in the morning. Yes. It's usually done like around. First thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I yeah. think most centers try and get them out in the morning. Definitely. Um, Cause you don't want to, you know, if someone's manic and unwell, mm keeping them fasted, it's probably quite a difficult un, un, and unnecessary risk. Uh, so most, most of the time it's, it's done in the morning. Um, and, uh, and then you, you go into that oper operating theater. Yeah. So, uh, that's right. I, I usually, uh, it depends who's kind of leading the day. Sometimes the consultant asks me to kind of take the charge. Uh, and then I'll usually introduce myself to the patient and introduce the psychiatry team. Mm. And I'll usually explain that it's going to be a little overwhelming because there's lots of people in the room. Um, and if it's your first time in a surgical room, it like, I can only imagine what it's kind of like going into a Formula One pit stop. Like you're, you're lying on the bed. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the psychiatry team on one side um, putting monitoring probes on you. The anesthetics are doing their thing, putting a cannula in. So you do kind of feel like people are going from all angles. Hey. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I, I imagine it would be quite overwhelming. Um, sort of people coming at you from everywhere, different people asking you a whole bunch of questions, checking to make sure that you are the correct person. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, um, and things like that. But we can slow it down if people ask. Yeah. Like if, and we, we get a sense if someone's feeling overwhelming or un, mm. you know, unstable, we'll just do one person talking at a time and approaching at a time. So you know, I think the different people, like we can accommodate different needs. And I think people get used to it as well. Um, usually there'd be anywhere between sort of six, nine, sometimes more treatments in a course, you know, and after a while, I think people become quite accustomed to what to expect and things like that. And it's probably not quite so um, intimidating and, and scary as it, as it may have been that first time. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I think that's right. So um, that kind of leads naturally into this acute versus maintenance terms we've been using. Um, and I guess it depends on the indications. So maybe let's start about it. Let's talk a little bit about indications. Why, Good idea. why, why get ECT? Yeah. Not something that you would just do for the fun of it really. And, um, you know, and, and, and it's quite expensive, um, giving ECT as well. It requires a lot of specialized equipment and people with very specialized skills, um, in order to, to provide e e ECT, um, in the modern sort of setting as well. So, um, and for that and, and the other reasons that we sort of alluded to before, um, part of the history of ECT, we do tend to reserve it for the more serious sorts of psychiatric conditions, perhaps those that are imminently um, threatening the person's life um, through suicidality perhaps, or um, perhaps they're severely depressed and not eating and drinking, you know, and likely to... Um, quickly become unwell if that were the case. Um, and Just to interrupt there though, I wanted to, around it being an expensive treatment to administer. Yeah. Uh, it's expensive to the healthcare system. Right. But a patient who's a citizen of Australia, for example, wouldn't have to pay a dime. Yes, um, exactly. But yeah, so it's for quite severe cases you were saying. Yeah. Uh, suicidality, catatonia. Right, catatonia as well. I mean, catatonia in particular tends to... So, so catatonia, you know, is a... Um, is one of those psychiatric conditions. Um, it's not always psychiatric, it could be due to other causes, but leads to people becoming profoundly stuck and ambivalent, unable to often talk or engage with people at all, or even move their bodies. Um, it's no doubt very scary and a horrible um, place to be for someone and people coming out of it will often um, uh, talk about how horrible it was to be that that stuck um, for that period of time. Um, and so, but catatonia just responds profoundly well to ECT. 
um, and it uh, about ninety percent of the time for someone with catatonia, they will recover quite quickly from from it. It's truly wow. extraordinarily effective for I, catatonia. I did not rec- realize it was a ninety percent mm, response rate. That's right, yeah. yeah, and it's usually quite quick as well. That's right, yep. That's the other thing about it, you know, if someone is ser- seriously unwell and, um, you know, likely to to die be- because of their condition, then you tend to want to use a treatment that's going to work quickly. Yeah, that's right. And although we always try to, um, you know, do voluntary and, and have consent with mm. ECT, uh, especially considering the the difficult history of involuntary exactly. ECT, yeah. uh, there are cases where involuntary ECT orders have to be made, and that requires not only the treating doctor mm. to make a, a a decision, but a second opinion and an independent body of someone with legal and psychiatric expertise. Yeah, that's right. So that's the tribunal, that ind- the independent body who um, get involved to provide that that. That third opinion in a way. Yeah, it's kind of oversight, isn't it? We so need that it. yeah, exactly. So that it's not um, a psychiatry as a whole kind of making these decisions, that there's an independent body that oversees the whole process to ensure that it's happening um, for the right reasons. Yep. So in terms of indications, we covered um, yeah, severe depression, uh, catatonia. Mm. It's also used in mania and, mm. and, and psychosis for some people. And and some people who have had chronic illnesses who get their kind of relapses and they've had so many relapses of their illness and they know that ECT is the best thing that works for them. You know, they've had previous manic episodes and they've been in hospital for three months on medications and yeah. they've done nothing. Then they've had other manic episodes and they've had ECT and they're better in a week. And it's like... Just get to, I, 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 you know, people can actually do advanced care directives and yep. be like, give me ECT if I get unwell again. So knowing someone's history is super important. But um, yeah, those are the big ones. Uh, psychosis, mania, de- treatment res- resistant depression, catatonia. But there's, pro- there's probably others that we're not covering right now, but um, it's a versatile treatment. Uh, I guess in layman's turn, it's kind of like turning the brain off and on again. <laughs> How it's, does it work? Why don't we talk a bit about uh, seizures and BDNF alpha and mm. uh, sorry, yeah, BDNF uh, and how that relates to improvements in uh, in mental health? Um, just before that, I think this is there's a couple of extra categories I think um, where ECT is particularly useful. You know. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever worked um, at older persons' mental health before, but... I haven't done a term yeah. um, specifically, but I've been involved in the care for older people. Yeah. In my experience working in older persons' mental health, I have had a number of experiences whereby we've had an older person receive a course of ECT, um, usually because they're they're depressed, um, oftentimes you know, with a severe psychotic depression. And in the family meetings afterwards, I've heard at least five or six times from different people, um, a very similar story. And basically, they're they're just very grateful to um, us for bringing their their mom, uh, mom or dad or or grandma or grandfather back to them. Mm. Uh, Essentially, they they have faded away um, and been barely there at all. And then it sort of brings them back very quickly and people, it, it almost seems like like magic. And This is one of the most beautiful things of working in psychiatry where in so many other specialties, you know, you don't, well, in psychiatry, you just, you really get to change a person from a, from a state of despair and hopelessness and pain. And you can really change their identity and, and bring them back to life in a way. Yeah. Not always, right? I'm not, I don't want to romanticize um, what is a you know very difficult area, but you do get these wins uh, frequently. So an ECT is an important part of uh, of, that, of that treatment. So yeah, why don't we now continue on to kind of the mechanism? Um, uh, obviously, it's incompletely understood. It That's my go-to answer for all exam it questions around is. mechanism yeah. and etiology. Right. Incompletely understood. Yeah. But we're getting bits of information in. Um, so if you can talk about seizures and BDNF alpha and how that affects mental uh, the brain's function, that would be really interesting to hear about. I can definitely speak about some of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I suppose. We don't know exactly. Um, the brain is a complicated organ, perhaps the most complicated organ. Um, we'll I'm ever... hearing all the cardiologists say, no, it's the heart, and the nephrologists say, no, it's the kidneys. Exactly. No, the brain's pretty 
up there? Um, there are about 100 billion neurons with around about 1,000 synapses each. So, uh, wow, 100 billion neurons, 1,000 connections each to on other average, neurons yep. on average, some mm. more, some less. Yes. Uh, that's... That's incredible. It's just un- the scale of the yeah. complexity there is, even imagine it. is astounding. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 just incredible. So it's kind of no wonder, therefore, that that people are fascinating and the the ways in which the brain goes wrong, as well as the ways in which it goes right, are interesting and varied. So what do we know? I guess what can we talk to in terms of uh, the mechanism of ECT? Yeah. Uh, so. It's generally thought to be the seizure that, and the response of the brain to the seizure that provides the um, the therapeutic benefit. Once uh, a brain, so, so once once a seizure occurs, it causes this sort of widespread change in metabolism um, over the short term, and then the brain basically responds um, to try and reduce the chance of further seizures. So it essentially has an anti-seizure effect. Um, And each individual treatment sort of furthers that anti-seizure treatment. We know that anti-seizure treatments are beneficial in mental illness. Um, We initially know this from epilepsy, right? And the sort of anticonvulsants that we give to people with epilepsy, they're effective, they work. Um, We later discovered that the same drugs are also beneficial for people with bipolar disorder. Not quite sure exactly how it's thought to be through this kindling type of effect, um, whereby um, the chance of... uh, So every seizure in epilepsy um, carries a risk of, of further seizures and that's how people tend to get worse and the same is true with bipolar. Um, For some reason, the seizures that you um, induce in ECT tend to go in the opposite direction um, and tend to damp down on that. They reduce the excitability of the brain, particularly where it's dysfunctional, across the whole brain as well, you know. Yeah, that's... um... That's, yeah, that's so strange how in the induced seizures of ECT don't have that, don't lower your seizure threshold moving forward in life. Mm. Um, so um, you, you, there's a, an electrical stimulus mm. that goes um, either, there's three different options of how it can be administered. There's other nuanced ones. There's, what are the three different options? Yeah, so I guess the first one is the, the bifrontal yep. electrode placement. Um, that's where you have one electrode on either side of the frontal part of the skull. It yep. goes through the frontal lobes and out the other side and stimulates just that part of the brain. And that one's usually good if someone has a cardiac arrhythmia. Exactly, because mm. it will skip the brainstem um, right. and all the, cardiac, the yeah, all the cardiac centers that are in the brain stems, and it won't cause as profound of a tachycardia and things like that. Okay. Yep. Then what are the other two? Then, uh, then you've got um, another bilateral one, uh, bitemporal, that goes uh, basically from one temple and out the other one, um, and that tends to um, affect most or all of the brain and so you do get with that particular one perhaps more memory type problems than you would um, with some of the other treatments um and right unilateral is the last one isn't it there's a couple of extra ones you're right yeah um the last common one i guess yeah that's right and i think there's um lart left anterior right temporal Temporal, that's the only other one that i can think of right now yeah. Yeah. So all these different uh, electrode placements um, fundamentally do the same thing. They administer mm. an electric stimulus to the neuronal tissue, and um, neurons are firing based off of a chemical gradient that is uh, a membrane potential, and and ions moving across the membrane is what triggers an electrical impulse and an action potential down the neuron. So electricity can do that too, not just chemicals. Um, and then what's what, what happens after the el- electricity is kind of administered? So you initially deliver the stimulus to, to one part of the brain um, and then eventually you'll get recruitment of um, sort of um, seizure type activity within that part of the brain. But the critical thing with ECT is that it generalizes to the rest of the brain. So it's the seizure starts off in one area, wherever that 
wherever that may be, um, and then it will spread to the other parts of the brain through the, the thalamus, which is a, a relay station of the brain, um, but also through the corpus callosum, which is that uh, the bunch of fibers that sort of connect the left and right hemispheres together. That's so satisfying to understand that. I never kind of mem- like uh, visualized the journey of the seizure through the brain. But yeah, it's going through those highways across That's the right. corpus callosum through yep. the thalamus. Yeah. And and you can we can see that through electrodes on the on the scalp. So we use yep. an EEG, an electroencephalogram, uh, to monitor brain waves and you can see how the the neurons are recruiting and generalizing and the interhemispheric concordance, the two sides of the brain being activated together. Yep. Because if there's one more than the other or if it's just in one part of the brain and not another part of the brain, you get less therapeutic benefit. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of different um uh, features of the EEG that w- when you're looking at it that sort of uh, have been shown to predict a better or a worse outcome. Oh, what yeah. awesome. Yeah, so you've, you've, you've named one of them, the, um, the, the concordance or coherence between the, uh, the sort of spiky waveforms that you're looking at in each side of the brain. When they're nice and synchronized, then you've got a, a, a really good seizure. It's generalized really well. So it's, it's come across to the other side and the whole, I guess, brain is experiencing seizure activity and it's nice and, and synced up. Um, that's definitely one. Um, one of the other ones is the amplitude. So if you're getting big, really nice, high amplitude waveforms on that EEG, then that's also likely to be a better quality, more therapeutic seizure. Um, then um, one of the other ones that relates back to what we were saying before is once the the seizure has begun, has began to stop um, if it rapidly winds down and stops over the course of say a second and then you get a just a flat trace um, afterwards uh, then you would call that a really good post ictal suppression that is uh, definitely probably the one shown to best correlate with with uh, therapeutic outcomes so to, uh, to summarize in in simple terms i'm a simple guy so you want a quick start Big amplitude, even uh, on both sides, and then a quick stop. Yep. And I guess you want it to last more than 20 seconds, is it? Yeah. About 20, yeah. Yeah, 20, yeah, 20 to 60 seconds is probably the threshold. And I guess the important thing for people to know if they're receiving it or someone they love is receiving it is that if it's lasting too long, the, the anesthetist is there ready with all the medications to terminate it. Um, exactly. So during a seizure, one doesn't breathe effectively um, but before the seizure they're pre-oxygenated with lots of oxygen so that all the o- organs are just saturated with high doses of sweet oxygen uh, so that it can survive a minute without breathing yeah most people can hold their breath for a minute though that's so right it's, it's, it's not too bad but uh, so we, we we got a bit sidetracked because mm. I just wanted to get to the point that when somehow when all these neurons are you know, essentially spitting out all their neurotransmitters, Mm. somehow that relates to the release of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Yeah, yeah. Well, we know that um, seizure activity stimulates um, gliosis, uh, but it also stimulates um, neurogenesis as well. So, um, and the evidence of that is the fact that you can detect an increase in um, BDNF um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, I think it's in the serum afterwards, which is often a proxy for some something, an antidepressant or whatever, causing an increase in um, uh, neuronal growth and development. Yes. Usually a good thing. Yeah, that's right. So um, there was a paper I was reading from 2021 talking about a set of experiments showing how SSRI's main mechanism is through the TRKB receptor, which is the receptor for BDNF. Right. Transient nothing receptor kinase. Tyrosine receptor right. yeah. kinase. Tyrosine, nice. that's one, yeah. But it had nothing to do with serotonin. Right. And so we've had this philosophy that's probably outdated around serotonin. That, uh, that I'll make a video about it once I've read a bit it's more about it. A video for but it, it sounds like we're in the midst of a paradigm shift towards BDNF instead of serotonin. Maybe we'll find out one day that it was something else, but or that it is it serotonin is involved. But then there's also other things. You know, serotonin was part of the story, which is where my my money would be if I was 
if I was a betting man. Yeah, that's right. There's so many neurons. There's so many variabilities in the receptors that they express. Yeah, especially the serotonin sy- sy- um, system. It's so less. It's so much less clean than like the dopaminergic systems. It's ridiculous. Uh, so, who knows? Anyway, BDNF, yes, it does relate to um, uh, forming new neural circuits. So mm. that could be one of the mechanisms. So we talked about the indications. We talked a little bit about how it works. I guess we haven't, by, we haven't focused on the side effects because it, it's not without a price to pay. You know, nothing comes for free, I guess. So um, maybe we can run through some of the common side effects that someone receiving ECT could, could have. Yeah. And maybe also, Russell, talk about the different types of ECT and how that affects um, uh, side effects too because that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, Yeah, look, you you touched on it a bit there when you said nothing comes for free. Um, I'll often say to patients that um, no no medication or intervention that works is free of side effects, right? Anything that's potentially able to work – has to work via some type of a mechanism and because everyone's different you you can never have anything that's that's has side no side effects there's always going to be some potent, possible side effects so that's a yeah that's a helpful thing to to say to to remember not only that there's no treatment that comes without side effects or the risk of side effects but not doing treatment comes with side effects exactly like you have to compare the side effects of treatment with the effects of not doing treatment Right, exactly. And that's kind of what we do, right? We, we weigh up the pros and cons of any particular treatment in the context of the patient. Like ultimately we want to do what's best by the patient, but sometimes that choice is, is, is difficult and you sometimes have to weigh up sort of many different factors to try and really personalize a, a treatment for, for someone. Um, ECT is no different in, in, the, in that regard. Um, because you're right, it does carry um, a burden of side effects. Um, absolutely, um, it's you, you know it, it's it's um, I guess a somewhat more extreme type of a treatment. Um, and as we said before, it's reserved for those generally that are particularly unwell. Um, so I guess I would normally break the different types of side effects up by what they um, um, or how they occur in relation to, for example, um, any anyone getting an anesthetic is going to have a series of potential side effects, including sort of anesthetic reactions and stuff like that. And that's also true of ECT. Um, and then I guess there's the side effects from the the actual stimulus itself and 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 from the seizure. They depend on electrode placement as well. So those different electrode placements we were were talking about before do tend to have um, an effect on what sorts of side effects that someone might be expected to experience. Um, For example, the bifrontal electrode placement, as we alluded to before, is good for avoiding um, uh, the heart. Um, And another benefit is that it tends to skip the hippocampus and the sort of the limbic system in the midbrain, um, which is particularly important for memory formation and memory recall. So bifrontal skips, well, more or relatively, less, relatively yeah. skips, um, spares the hippocampus and limbic system. I didn't correct, know that. Correct, correct. Okay. And bitemporal probably hits it the most. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's particularly important because – it tends to be the memory and cognitive side effects of ECT that are the hardest for patients, I think. Now, it's also true that being severely depressed or being floridly manic is also very bad for your cognition and and also your memory too. So you're not just, you have to weigh up both of those really before you can um, make a decision um, about what what is best for your patient, and I should say that ideally, and as much of the time as possible, we would have the patient involved in this whole des- decision making process. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's an important thing to remember that a manic mind is a, it's a, a a 
it's not healthy for the neurons. No, you it's know, kind of what, burning in exactly. it. Exactly, it's sense. using up all the resources. You, you get neuronal death. You get atrophy. You can see yeah. on scans of people who've been manic for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in, in those cases, you know, this is a um, uh, brain saving intervention. Exactly. Very counterintuitive. I totally understand where people come from when they say, "How can a seizure be?" Help healthy for the brain, especially if you see like someone have a seizure on the street, mm. it doesn't look healthy. But in the controlled environment, for the right duration, done with the right dosing, um, and the right supports, it's it is helpful and effective. Yep. Yeah. Are there any myths or misconceptions that you've heard of that you you have to debunk when you're talking to patients about ECT? Yeah, lots. I mean, I guess that uh, that it's it's a punishment, you know, a form of punishment um, that unfortunately has some historical baggage, you know, uh, once upon a time, a long time ago, I guess back in the probably 50s and 60s, uh, perhaps the 70s, um, there was, uh, it was used, you know, a lot less, I guess, carefully and ju judiciously. And so um, there were incidents of that occurring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything like that happening for a long, long time now, many, many decades. Um, but unfortunately, that that does sort of carry over sometimes. Yeah. Um, also, I guess that people struggle with the notion that it's not damaging them or it's not hurt, hurting them. Um, sometimes family members as well are often, um, it takes a sort of, a careful approach to sort of talk them through the whole, the whole, um, the pros and cons really. Yeah. What about you? Have you had any experiences? I think there's a lot of, uh, fear of the unknown and, uh, and that's why podcasts like this can be very helpful, I think. But usually once I run people through the experience, explain, that it's under an anesthetic and they'll be unconscious. That tones that that'll take out a lot of the fear. Um, I th I think there's just that image of uh, is it Jack Nicholson? That, that just that that image of him biting down on a mouth guard with the thing that's imprinted so viscerally on so many people's mind's eye from yeah. the one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. It is a fantastic movie. It's such a good movie, but. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, isn't that an interesting thing? Like, it's such a wonderful piece of art. Um, has it done more good than harm, though? I wonder. That's a that's a good essay question. <laughs> it, it might well have uh, to kind of raise awareness and to kind of shine a spotlight um, onto something, and perhaps it puts some impetus into mental health and psychiatry as a whole to to really make sure that the way we do it these days is just absolutely meticulous. Yeah. It is we are heavily scrutinized and that results in a very um, thoughtful experience. Like the, a lot of the experience has been thought out, planned. There's a lot of policies around everything. So, yeah, that's a very good point. So then where where to from here is ECT? Do you see ECT around in 50 years or 100 years? What do you think is the future of like neurostimulation? Well, I, that's two different questions, I guess, because there's more than one type of neurostimulation. ECT, I feel, has probably got to where it's going to get. I don't imagine there's going to be too many massive breakthroughs. It's kind of been the same for a while now in terms of how effective it is. Um, there's still evidence coming out um, in different populations and things like that. Um, but if you had have asked me that question, maybe... 18 months ago, I probably would have said something about RTMS because that's another type of neurostimulation that doesn't cause a seizure, um, that looks really promising for a variety of things um, and might turn out to be very beneficial. So TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation and R repetitive? Repetitive, yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, would you want to give us a quick rundown? We don't have to do a full podcast on it, but yeah, sure. <laughs> Why are you hopeful about that? So, so I guess the main difference here is that RTMS is delivered to awake. 
people um, in a sort of walk-in type of a clinic usually um, with a machine that sort of sits, it's got a little coil that sort of sits near the head. It delivers just um, magnetic pulses um, to the brain over a period of time. Um, and they have a similar kind of effect on the underlying brain, but it doesn't cause a seizure. And so people tend to... Um, um, I mean, it's it's not completely benign. Um, people can have a little bit of scalp um, pain as a result, but that's mainly the only side effect. It doesn't cause memory problems. You don't have to give an anaesthetic um, and things like that. And there's a lot of work going on trying to find um, different parts of the brain and different combinations of coil shapes uh, and um, ways of delivering the pulses uh, to have different effects. This is an active area of research right now, um, actually, with some recent very exciting results, which unfortunately seem to have not been replicated. Um, ah, okay. Which, which I would have thought was perhaps the type of treatment that might eventually unseat ECT. Um, but now I have less confidence that that's going to ever be the case yeah so watch this space yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um one thing we didn't talk about is medications and ect which mm. is really important actually um i've seen uh someone uh, have sub suboptimal seizures due to medication interference same because um, obviously i mean it's, it's super complicated because the medication that the anesthetic is giving has anti-seizure properties as right. well, the propofol. So can you talk to that point a little bit about um, medications and ECT before we close? Yeah. I guess there's, there's kind of two main categories of things that I worry about um, and one's lithium, you know, uh, because people on lithium often it's for depression or, or otherwise bipolar depression. Um, so people uh, will need to withhold the, the lithium dose the, the night before um, otherwise it can cause a, a, a sort of a delirium type picture that, that can um, happen after the ECT that can be, you know, quite scary for people being delirious is, doesn't look like, um, much fun and certainly is not good for your brain as well. Um, Any ideas how, how lithium has that effect? Has that been hypothesized or yeah, theorized? Yeah, I think we know uh, because the ECT alters the blood-brain barrier permeability. Yeah, and so as a result, you get a massive, I guess, crossing of a lithium into the brain. That's um, – so it's – because we lithium is one of those drugs that uh, has a – therapeutic window so we take blood tests to make sure people don't go too high yeah uh and, and if people are too high they can get it into a delirium so it's kind of like yeah um getting a like tripling the dose really quickly right You're exactly like, wow yeah, yeah. Uh, okay so lithium is a big one to monitor mm. uh so you withhold it the night before typically but talk to your doctors first don't yep. do anything without talking to your doctors um but uh any other medications that people should be aware of and the other class is your anticonvulsants really or, or any medications which affect um, the seizure threshold we would say or um, any any medications that kind of reduce the um, the excitability of the brain and hence um, will make you have less of a seizure um, perhaps or maybe no seizure at all um, these are sorts of things like like valium and all of the benzodiazepines um, for example um, they all all of them have that that sort of an effect so you you certainly want to be um, reducing those and ideally kind of weaning them and stopping them before the course of ECT um, as they're not the sorts of medications that you want to stop all of a sudden, especially it needs to be done slowly and carefully. That's a really good point. Yeah, if you've been on benzodiazepines for a long time, it can be really dangerous. And there are um, medications that don't affect seizure thresholds as much like like antipsychotics that can right. help and have similar effects. So definitely worth talking to your doctors about that. Um, and, and the other category yeah, any, would, would be the, um, the sort of, um, anti-epileptic medications, which are also used in bipolar disorder as well. You know, so the mood stabilizers really, yeah, um, things like sodium valproate, yeah. And carbamazepine, um, they're sort of the main. Lamotrigine? Two. Lamotrigine too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing that's just, uh, it's quite 
actually beautiful to talk about. It's not about side effects, but just the way that the anesthetics have worked out how to put someone into an anesthetic coma uh, or make someone unconscious, but still allow them to have a seizure because it's all about timing. Yeah. And so the way they do it, for those who don't know, it's they, they give this pulse. So normally in a long case, a long procedure, you'll have an infusion mm. about over hours of a slow drip of propofol or whatever the agent ketamine or whatever they're using. But with, with, with um, ECT, they'll give a pulse of the anesthetic and time it so that we don't do anything. We don't give the, this, the stimulus for the seizure until about, you know, depending on what, um, it's usually two minutes. There's some complexity to that, but usually after the two minutes mark because the body has metabolized it enough such that the three seizure threshold has dropped. The muscle relaxant is at the right dose, but they're, they're both coming still down. Still unconscious. You're, and you're still unconscious, yeah. but the doses are start like they're just at the peak. Yeah. And then um, the seizure threshold is at the right level to give the dose. Uh, because if you give it too early, you'll get a crap seizure and it's a wasted opportunity. If you give it too, well, we don't give it too late. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's one of the things we're very cautious about. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, it, it is quite a coordinated uh, thing and that's where mm. communication is so important. And um, yeah, so that, that's, uh, I, I just find that kind of science and clinical application to have kind of, yeah, it, it's quite beautiful how it comes together and we've found this way of doing it that, that works well. Yeah. It's, um, kind of like a, a symphony with all the different doctors and the other sort of allied health cooperating there in the um, operating theater to make everything happen all at the exact right time. Yeah. I think that's what I, that's right. It's a symphony and that's the kind of crescendo that it all comes to a point where it's so, it's so multidisciplinary, as you said, there's not just psychiatry and anesthetics. So there's the nursing staff, the wardsmen, the, um, you know, the admin stuff it's all coordinated and and it comes through to this like timed event over and um, over again very like a, safe and it's been it's just like been a well-oiled ch- machine well-oiled machine so things i'm sure do go wrong but i haven't seen that fortunately and, and what i've seen is, is that it's run really really well and that it's safe and effective so is there any final points russell that you want to end on any messages you would have to someone who's questioning whether they should get ect despite their doctors telling them they should yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd bring it back to my own journey, really, which was, you know, began with me being highly sceptical about it. Um, and then as over the last sort of 10 years, as I was exposed to it more and more, um, it really um, is one of the most effective treatments in psychiatry. It, and it really does save a lot of lives, um, but is, is really super stigmatised. Um, so I guess I'd probably just recommend um, anyone speak to, you know, their, their psychiatrist or, or if you have um, a loved one that's um, unwell right now and ECT is potentially on the cards, you know, speak to the treating team there um, and they, they will talk to you about, um, you know, whether or not it's suitable and um, the treatment and things like that because I think it would be a shame for someone who could benefit from it um, but um, didn't have enough information or knowledge to make an informed choice to to miss out because of that that stigma yeah so i think that's a really nice place to leave it and thank you for making the time to talk about ect uh, on a monday evening <laughs> thank you and i'll see you later at work <laughs> yep i'll see you at work thanks russell